by your beauty and by your majesty. And we pray, O oh Jesus, that you would reign in us as we sang in the song and that you would be, you would have your rightful place in our hearts and in our lives, that you would consider our heart, that you would feel comfortable, that it would be a home to you, not just a place of visiting, but that you would be able to do whatever you want in us. We pray that we would have soft hearts, hearts of flesh that allow you through the Word and the Holy Spirit to, to change us and to mold us into your image. We pray for a blessing in this time that you'd speak to our hearts and that you'd minister to us and that you would use your powerful Word in our lives to transform us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 3, we met last time two weeks ago and we, did, we finished verse 10, so tonight we will start with verse 11. But since it's been two weeks and... I'm not going to ask what we said, so I don't get sad. <laughs> so I will just uh, summarize quickly what we spoke about. So uh, basically, we talked about prayer and how good prayer looks like. What does that look like? And so we talked that it basically needs to contain four things. Okay, Thing number one is found, uh, verse 10, night and day praying. And so the first thing is our prayer needs to stop being this spasmodic, occasional, once in a while, uh, okay, in the time of crisis, okay, I'm in trouble right now, or I have this big decision, or, and it, it needs to stop to be only in that time. But it needs to be all the time, including all those things, because those are awesome too. We need God. We don't know how to do it. When we're in crisis, we need Him, but we need to always want to talk with him. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I have a relationship. If you're uh, married, you're not going to be like, or if you're engaged to be married, you're not going to be like, hey, right, I'll call you when I need you, all right? That's just not, it's not going to go well. You're going to be in trouble, and that won't last very long. And so, it needs to be night and day. The second thing that needs to be in prayer, praying exceedingly. It needs to be fervent. It needs to be exciting. It's not boring. Prayer is not boring. You're not talking to a wall. You're not talking to some imaginary being out there who doesn't really exist. You're speaking with God. Speak to Him as you would speak to someone very close to you, but He is much closer and He knows you much better. So that's the second thing about prayer. The third thing about prayer is that we may see your face. Prayer needs to be specific. It doesn't need to be this whole, like, includes everybody. It's so nonspecific that it really is praying about nothing. So it needs to be very specific. Things that show that you believe in the power of God. Because we've been talking here about tribulation, about troubles, about trials that we go through. And Satan is after one thing. And that's his leverage. Why? He's after, what is it? He's after faith. Why? Because faith is that we defined, not defined, but we said one of the, the, the ways faith shows up is that I believe in a God who I can't see. But I believe, I'm so confident in his existence more than I am in the reality I see before me. That's what faith is. Faith is not this blind feeling of, um, of uh, that you're just like, oh, you know, I think, and you're hoping for something that doesn't exist. It's not, you know, daydreaming and, and you know, dreaming about some things that may not happen. It's actually knowing for sure, for a fact, that God can do whatever it is that he says and claiming it before I have it. And that's why if you look at all the faith, if you look at Hebrews 11, all the people of the faith, there's so many mentioned, but there's ten, only 10 of them that are mentioned by name and by action. It talks about that God promised them something. They claimed that something, but the thing that God promised every single one of them was an impossible thing. Just not possible at all from a human logical perspective, yet they claimed it as if it's theirs. They lived as if it's theirs. And they received it, and some of them received it way later. Like Abraham, for example, he got the promise that he would have a son. He got it 25 years later. He received this promise from God 25 years later, but he lived owning, taking that. He says, that promise is mine. I believe God. But Satan is good too. He's invisible, just like God is invisible. And he knows that faith has to do with believing in someone who's invisible. So he says, I have the upper edge. I have the upper hand. Because I'm going to mess with your mind. The mind is his battlefield. He says, I'm going to come and straight for your mind, and I'm going to mess with you. And I'm going to say, dude, have you seen him? 
How do you know it's not just some feelings that you want to feel? And he'll start playing with us and messing with our faith. But when we pray specifically, now God, we are able to measure him answering our prayer. And so here Paul prayed specifically. He said, my specific prayer request is, it's actually made up of four things, but the first one and the main one, he says, to, or, or the first one of it, the first section of it is to see your face. I want to see you. I miss you guys. I just want to see you so bad. To see your face. The fourth part of prayer is, and, you know, I really like this because, you know, English is my second language, and um, Valerie is like, you know, uh, majors in linguist, language related. It's not really linguistics, but she like supposedly knows three languages very good. Whatever. <laughs> Just kidding. But yeah, she, you know, she knows English, French, and Arabic, right? You're majoring in Arabic and, and French. That's pretty good, you know, because most People here of Arabic background, you don't even know how to speak it. You sound funny. And so I see her, I see her not listening to, uh, to translation, so I don't know if she understands or not, but that's good. So when, we, when there's preaching in Arabic. But, but with that, she actually made a mistake in reading English. And so she said, and perfect, what is lacking in your faith, it's perfect, okay? Thank you, Valerie. I just want to... <laughs> no. <laughs> perfect. I'm just teasing. Perfect what is lacking in your faith. The fourth aspect of prayer that is really important is it needs to be selfless. Here he's not praying for himself. Now, is, is Paul like on vacation, hanging out, chilling? No. What is his current situation? I'll tell you real quickly, um, verse 7. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction, so that means there's more than one if it's all our affliction, and distress, so there's lots of affliction and lots of distress. He is in trouble. He is, has a, his, the pressure is on. He has a lot of difficulties that he's going through, yet when he prays, he prays selflessly. He's not praying for himself, but he's praying for them. And what is his specific prayer for them? It's also, you know, the thing is what Paul is going through, those guys are going through it. The only difference is they are baby Christians, and he's a mature Christian. And what does he want for them? He says, I want you to be mature Christians. I want God to perfect, because you see, God said no to my first prayer request. I already know it. My first prayer request is, I want to see you. So I gave him a specific thing that is measurable, and I got an answer that is measurable, and the answer is no. You will not get to see them. And what is standing in your way, Paul? I'll tell you. If you go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Two times he attempted, and the one that's standing in his face is Satan. He's like, easy, God, you're stronger than Satan. I want to see them. And God says, no. This time I'm going to have Satan stand in your way and you can't. And Satan is stronger than you. And I'm not going to get Satan out of your way because I just don't want you to go there. And it was a blessing because because of that, we got this amazing letter that talks about the rapture. That talks about the coming of Jesus Christ to take us to him. And so here he says, listen, when I'm praying to you guys, even though God gave me a measurable answer, and it's not the type that I'm looking for. He said, no, that I can't see your face. But I'm going to pray for you guys. But I'm going to pray selflessly. So his second prayer request is that he may perfect what is lacking in your faith. I want God to perfect you, to give you better faith. And as we spoke last week, uh, two weeks ago, I'm not going to take time to talk about that, is that these people were not weak in faith. They actually had very strong faith. Yet they're baby Christians, Baby Christians who have not dipped, who have not, had, who have not had those, you know, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done this type of situations in their life, in their faith, always staying strong. And, and we've seen here that God has set us, even though it looks like the odds are, not, are against us, looks, the odds look like they're against us, but God has put it in our favor because He's with us. If we trust in Him and if we rely on Him and if we have faith in our trials and in our tribulation. And so here is to perfect what is lacking in your faith. And He says, listen, what I really want to pray for is your faith. 
Because that's what Satan is after, and I don't want you to have any just little faith or weak faith. or No, no, I want you to have perfect faith. I want God to perfect that faith to make it better and stronger than what it is right now, even if it is strong right now. It can never get strong enough. One guy, um, one guy said, faith is like a muscle. That the more you work it out, it gets stronger. You see, we all have muscles. But the thing is, if you go to the gym for the first time ever, I still remember my first time. You're like, wow, I didn't know I had muscles in these areas. Like, wow, there's a, this thing hurts here. It's like, there's a muscle here. I didn't know that. There's, this thing hurts here. Like, oh, there's muscles everywhere. And then after a while, you go and you used to go like, you know, to try to flex. You don't see anything. You see it looks flat. looks the same before and after. And then after a while, like, ooh, you're like, whew, this looks good. I'll tell you guys, you know, just to impress you guys. So, and to wake you guys up, but. So we have this uh, washer and dryer, and uh, they're kind of heavy. And so one time, like maybe two years ago or so, I don't remember, that, but a while ago, so my wife's like, ah, oh, something fell behind it. Can you help me out? <laughs> hey, you know, I'm a man. <laughs> so I go and <laughs> nothing. It doesn't even budge. It was so embarrassing. I said, oh, let me get some help. Let's have some. Anyway, I said, ah, that's not that. Is it important? We'll just leave it there. So anyways, about like a few weeks ago, there was a, um, what were we? we were doing something. And then anyways, so I was like, you know what? Why don't we uh, move the washer and I'll have you, but I have to move it far enough because it's a very small place. I have to move it way out. And then I said, you get behind it and then, you know, clean whatever and then find whatever. Maybe you could find that thing from two years ago, and then... <laughs> and so, this time, I, well, I've been working out, you know? So I'm like, okay, Lord, please, you know, like, you know, Samson, before he went to die, you know, he's like, Lord, just avenge me this time. <laughs> and I was like, Lord, don't embarrass me in front of my wife. <laughs> and I go, and I'm putting all my effort into it, and the thing was gonna, like, it was very easy to move. And she got, and I was like, oh. I hope you should remember the thing from two years ago. Faith is like a muscle. You work it out, you work it out, you get surprised after a while. You're like, wow, I didn't know I could do that. The thing is, we start like, really? Does God really exist? Is he really there? Is he there for me? And then you start experiencing God because you start trusting him. You, get, you take a baby step and wow, that muscle starts to develop. And then God says, you know what? I have to put you through, through some difficult times, through some difficult tests, because I need that muscle to get even stronger, to get even better. And then you're like, wow, my faith is really being tested. The faith gets tested, and then guess what? That muscle gets even bigger. Sometimes there's failures in that as these muscles are getting worked out. If you look at Abraham, he is the example of faith. He's actually full of failure in faith. But God used that failure after failure. He, he blew it so many times. I mean, he lied. Do you guys know how many times he lied that Sarah, is, he said his, she's his sister? Any ideas? Huh? Three times? Twice. Thank you. Twice. Okay, you redeemed yourself, Valerie. You said it right this time. Two times. But I mean, really, like, seriously, man, you are the man of faith. You are the measure that we all measure up to to get to faith. You go before Pharaoh. You're like, hey, you know, you're so beautiful. Sarah. So, um, because you're so beautiful, they might want to marry you. And uh, I don't want to die. I'm too young to die. He wasn't really that young, you know. She's younger than him by, you know how much? Ten years. So he got the promise that he's going to have a son at 75. So let's pretend it was 75. It was probably after that. So she's 65. He's afraid that someone's going to want to marry his 65-year-old wife. He says, I don't want to die. I'm too young to die. I'm only 75. And back in his days, they didn't live to 900 anymore. They lived to like about 120. So it's like, you know, you're... And uh, so... A little later, just a few generations later, Moses says, you know, my life maximum is like 70, and if you have like really strength, you take care of your health and stuff, you live to 80. 
So it's like, you're there, man. You're 75. Thought he lied. She's my sister. And then he played a little game. He's like, well, she's really half my sister, so it's okay. He justified it to himself. But God saved him. But then time passes. And then he goes before the same exact test again. And he lies again and says, she is my sister. But God was strengthening him even though he had failures. And in that, he still learned. He's like, wow, God, even when I fail, you're there for me. You want to pick me up? You want to help me out? You don't, you don't give up on me? You do all these things? Then the ultimate test came his way. Where after he's been waiting for 25 years for a son. Then that son is growing healthy, looks great. He loves him. He, he's, 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 he's everything to him. He says, okay, now go kill him. What? He just does it. He doesn't even ask questions this time. He does it and he gets up early. He doesn't even tell his wife. He goes and he's ready. He ties his son up. He puts him on there. And he's ready to go. And God says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. And then God gives him his promise. He says, you know, I have taken an oath by myself. And if you read in Hebrews, the oath is like the biggest thing ever. When someone takes an oath, that's their word. They have, to, they have to abide by it. But when God takes an oath, he abides by it. How is your faith? How is my faith? Here he's praying a selfless prayer. I want you to mature in your faith. And we've seen that his prayer was answered. So the first part of the prayer was not answered, which is to see your face. But the second part of the prayer is, I want you guys to be more mature in your faith. That part was answered. And I will review that in a minute. Verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. Here he, he goes back. He's like, I know he said no, but I just... I'm still hopeful. I just really can't wait to see you guys. I just love you guys so much. And that's why he says, listen, I'm praying here. Now tell me who he's praying to from the Trinity, okay? I'll read it again and you tell me who it is. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. Who is he praying to in the Trinity right now? The Father and Jesus. I agree. Now look at this verse. It's really beautiful. But it's more beautiful if you know how to read uh, Arabic or if you know Greek. And so here now may our God and Father himself. Here he says I'm praying to God the Father. Okay. He's, uh, he's our God and he's our Father himself. I want him. You see he's not just God. He's not just almighty but he's also personal to me. He's also my father. Now uh, may our God and father himself, but not just that, also and our Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord, Jesus Christ. And look at this beauty here, direct. God the Father, Jesus Christ is what? Singular or plural? Plural. Now if you read it in Arabic, direct is singular. If you read in Greek, direct is singular. What is this? This is beautiful. This is proof about the deity of Jesus Christ. And this is proof about the unity of God the Father and God the Son, that they are one. Let me say it in plain English. This says that Jesus Christ and God the Father are one and that Jesus Christ is God. If you're looking for things, if you meet some Muslims or some people who don't know, or even some of the, the cults that call themselves Christians, like Jehovah's Witness, and they think, and you know, people, uh, uh, Mormonism, and all those guys, you know, they're like, oh, Jesus is like, you know, he's a God, but he was created. Like, that's Jehovah's Witness. Like, okay, man. He is one with the Father. So was the Father created? No, no, no. Well, then here it says that they're one doesn't make any sense. But this is just one. There's so many things. 
And here, oh, Jesus, you know, is really like the son of the father. And then there's this other son. His name is Lucifer. And they kind of hate each other. Really? This is just wacky. It's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. There's no biblical basis to it. So here says, now may our God, and this is just, I'm giving you one. I love these pearls to do, so we can have. May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct singular our way to you. I just, I'll still keep praying about it even though he's saying no, but I just want to see you. I can't now express my love toward you guys, to the Father and the Son. I just can't do that. It's like Jesus Christ he knows that he is supposed to go to the cross, right? And he wants to go to the cross. And it's joyous for him to go to the cross. But then he prays to the Father. He says, if it is possible that you could take away this cup away from me. And this cup meaning, you know, the, everything that goes with the crucifixion. Physical, emotional, and spiritual suffering. We spent a message one time on it. What Jesus went through from his personal perspective. He told us about it in one of the Psalms. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love. So here we see that Paul loves them and he keeps expressing his love to God that he wants to see them. We saw that Jesus expressed his love for the Father, he says, I can't be separated from you, so take away this cup, but not my will but yours. But he says, I submit to you, and he wants to. And yet he continues to pray about it. Three times he prayed about that same prayer to the Father. It says, and he went and he prayed that same exact prayer. Three times. And so here Paul is expressing that. Now look at the next part. And this is the third part of the prayer that he's praying for. So first is he wants to see them. He says it twice. He says he wants to see them. And then he says, the second thing is he wants them to mature in specifically in their faith. And then third, uh, and then he goes back, he says, I want to see you, and I'm praying to God the Father and the Son, and we learn that Jesus Christ is equal with the Father and is united with the Father. And then he prays for the third thing, and may abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. So here he's praying for, he's saying, I want you guys to have love for one another. One, two, two. I want you to love all, so that's everybody. Third, the example of love that I want you to look at is just as we do to you. Love. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love. So how much more than what they currently have does he want them to have? About the same? More, just like a little more? A lot more. Why? He uses two very, very strong words, increase and abound. In love, and here he's talking specifically to one another, to believers. Okay, if someone comes to you and says, you know, I want you to increase and abound in your love to the fellow believers that are with you, what would you feel about that? You think, yeah. You feel like, what you talking about, man? I have a lot of love. I'm a very loving person. Right? You'd get offended if you feel like your love is high, right? Now, do you think these people have a lot of love already or not? Yes? Okay. You claim it with such strength. Prove it to me. I agree with you. So let me show you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We give thanks to God always for you all. I just, I'm always giving thanks to God for every single one of you. All you all, right? He says, making mention uh, of you, this verse 2, sorry. Making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing. And it's just, I, the, the, you guys left such a huge memory in my heart, in my life, that I just can't ever get it out of my mind. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. So they didn't have just faith, because faith without works is what is dead, as we read from James. You guys have 
work of faith. Your faith is real and it's very strong. And yet he prayed that he wants them what? God to perfect their faith too. So not only do they have faith, they have strong faith. It's proven faith. Second is labor of love. These guys have strong love. They don't have just love. They have labor of love. What does that mean, labor? The word labor is you means you break a sweat and you work really hard at it. Is love easy? It is not. And love is not an emotion. It's not like, oh, I love you today. Today, not so much. <laughs> I'm so in love with you. I can't stand your guts. You know, that's not love. That's, that's, that's this worldly stuff that we talk about. That's, that's the stuff that causes marriages to break down and all kind of things not to last. But true love is not an emotion. It's a command. Biblical love, it's something that is hard that you work on. And here he says, you guys understood this, so you were not like, oh, what am I feeling? Oh, hi, what did I wake up today? I woke a little emotional, so I'm going to be like, oh, good luck if you're in my face. No, you don't do that. You love people. Whether you like it or not, whether you feel it or not, it's not a feeling. And you have to work hard on it. Labor of love. These guys worked really hard on loving each other the right way. Because sometimes love, oh, it gets out of hand. Sometimes it's not even appropriate. And we're like, we love each other. We can't stay away from you. Yeah, but it's inappropriate. What happens? Real love. Godly love. And so here, labor of love. But he's saying, I want you guys that, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love. Just like faith, there's no limits. It's a muscle that can keep getting stronger. Same thing with love. There's no limits to the love that we can have for one another. So whatever you have right now, no matter how strong you think it is, God says, and the prayer is, I want it to increase and abound. You know, see so here, here's, you know, there's this cup here. I'll tell you, you can't see, but here's, here's the level of the water. Increase, meaning go to here. Abound, meaning I want it to overflow. Be dripping everywhere. Going love everywhere. Let me show you guys about these people in Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 9. Here he says, but concerning brotherly love. Here he's talking about what? Brotherly love in, in First Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 12, right? So here he's like, okay, concerning brotherly love. Okay, I want you guys to know something. You have no need that I should write to you. I don't even need to write about it, even though he did. But he says, I don't need to write to you about it. Why? For you, yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Yes, we taught you to love one another, but you actually know God well enough. And you've experienced God deep enough. That the love of God has been poured in your heart through the Holy Spirit that you don't need me to even teach you about it. Because you go straight to God and you hear from Him to love one another and you have this kind of love for one another. You have this kind of relationship toward brotherly love, toward other people, other Christians. And then he says, and indeed... It's not just you have some intellectual understanding of it only, but it says, and indeed, this is factual, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. Now when I, here's your knowledge, here's the cerebral part of this, I don't need to teach you because you know it, because you didn't just learn it from me, you learned it from God himself. But here's the practical, here's the heart, and here's the living it out portion. You do this to, er, to who, guys? For And indeed, you do, so, you do so toward who? Huh? Not the brethren, but all the brethren. You know what all the brethren is? Every single believer. They, they already know from God and they give godly love. True, appropriate. The right measure of godly love toward other believers. 
And they do it not to other believers, but to all the believers, to all the brethren. These guys blow me away. But it doesn't stop there. This is crazy. Who are in all Macedonia. Not in Macedonia again. Not brethren, but all brethren. Not just Macedonia, but all Macedonia. Now let me just review geography with you. Who is he writing to? The people where? Thessalonica. Thessalonica's little dot in a big region called Macedonia in northern Greece. Um, these people have godly love to who? All the believers in their church? Yes. But that's it? No. All the believers in their city? No. Yes, but not just that. All the believers in the whole region. Just think of it this way. If you have true, sincere, godly love toward every single believer in Long Beach, if you have that, in, in not Long Beach, in ABCC, I want you to know you're ahead of most people in your walk with God. You know how many members, how many people come to ABCC? Very little in comparison. Now, can you imagine that you love every single believer in Long Beach? Wow, that's a lot bigger. It's a big city. There's a lot of believers in this city. But can you imagine if you love all in L.A. County? Wow. That's the kind of love that these guys had. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. What? There's no limits. I mean, these guys, I, we feel crippled by seeing how much love they have. Like, Lord, my love is so weak. So restrained. You know, Paul told the Corinthians once, he says, guys, guys, open up a little. I'm wide open to you guys. Why are you like this toward me? Open up your hearts. Open up your hearts, accept this love, receive this love, and give this love. that you may increase more and more. And we urge you, urge you meaning this is really important, this is an emergency. Please increase more and more in your love for one another. Now, do you guys think, do you guys, so we've seen that God did not answer Paul's first request, which is to see their face. But we've seen that he answered their second request, which is, to mature their faith. Do you guys think that God answered his prayer, the third prayer request, the third part of the request, which is that they may increase and abound in their love? Do you think he did it or no? Yes, he did. So let me show you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. And in it, we'll review also the part about the faith, that his, he answered the faith. We are bound to thank God always for you. I just can't, I, I, I can't go outside of that. I just have to thank God for you, brethren, as it is fitting. And I just, I don't even need to be bound because that's just what's the right thing to do. It is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. You guys are like on this crazy mathematical formula that it is, it's ridiculous. It's amazing that your faith doesn't increase, but it, it is, it grows exceedingly. Have you guys ever heard that term exponential? You know, you guys know what the log of something is? I used to be good at math, but I know it's something like this, like, woo, it goes off the charts really fast. So here you have exponential. Your love, it's not like one plus one is two. Your love is like one plus one equals 20. You know, it's like God, God has, the pastor shared this last night. He says, you know, one believer to God, it's like a thousand. 
So if one believer to God is like a thousand, two believers is what? You think two thousand, right? But he says it's ten thousand. What? That's exponential to him. That's how powerful we are in the world. So that's why he said he said to them, he always sent them out as what? In pairs, right? Jesus Christ, when he was here, he sent them out in twos. Because he's like, to him, it's, it's a big deal what he's sending out. We see two going out, but he sees 10,000. He's like, these guys are going to conquer the world. They're going to take it down. And when he sends you alone somewhere, there's a thousand right there. If you're in high school, the only believer there, it's, it's like, it's cake. Are there a thousand people in your high school? You know? And even if there is, there's one of you, and I'm sure there's some other believer, 10,000. There are 10,000 in your high school, forget it. You're in good shape. You're in good shape. They got nothing on you. Just go share the gospel with them. Give them love. And so here we see that their, love, their faith sorry, is exponential. So here, because they, they committed themselves to God, because they trusted God, because that muscle kept getting stronger, it didn't get stronger in a normal fashion. It just got huge, really big, really fast, but no steroids. Real lasting stuff. That is there all the time. And so here he says that, brethren, as is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. I can't keep up with how awesome your faith is. It exceeds. It grows exceedingly. How about the love? And the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. And your love he said, I want it to increase and abound. Which is higher, increase or abound? Abound. He says, it's done. Done deal. He can keep just like, it's dripping everywhere. Everyone notices your love. Your love abounds to one another. Guys, when it comes to true love, you could talk about loving God all you want. It means nothing. If you and I don't love one another, it means nothing. If you don't believe me, if you look at the Gospel of John, chapter 13, this is Jesus Christ himself speaking. Let's look at verse... Um, 34. A new commandment I give to you. What is it? That you love one another. He didn't say that you love me. I mean, he's God. He's right there. Love me. No, he says, I want you to love one another. That's my new commandment. Okay, what's the measure? How do I know what that love looks like? He says, oh, simple. I'll tell you. As I have loved you. That's the measure. The measure of love is if you want to see what true love is, is what I do to you. Okay? That, that you also love one another. Again, he repeats it. I want you to love one another. Don't tell me you love me. I want you to love one another. And he says, by this all will know that you are my disciples. Who will know? Every single person that ever can comes in contact with you. Do you want them to know that you are a follower of Jesus? That you are a disciple of Jesus? By this, all will know. What is this? And be like, well, I don't know. Do I go back to the verse before it or not? He says, fine, I'll just tell you again. If you have love for one another. Not just say, tell people, I love God so much and you hate your brother. That doesn't make sense. He says, you haven't seen me and you've seen your brother and you can't stand them. How are you going to love me? You haven't even seen me. By this, all will know. There'll be no, it is so obvious that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If you look at the Gospel of John chapter 15, verse 13. This is Jesus Christ speaking again. He says, no longer do I call you servants. You're not my slaves. For a servant does not know 
Well, hey, actually, let's go a few verses before that. Let's go to verse 13. Greater love, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another. What's the measure? As I have loved you. This is my commandment. I'm going to keep repeating it, and I'm going to keep repeating it, and I'm going to keep repeating it. And if you look, John is the one that wrote this. If you look at First John, he talks about love, love, love. Love for one another. And so here Jesus says in verse 12, uh, John 15, 12, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The same measure that I've loved you. And he says, so you don't think, what does that mean? I'll tell you exactly what that means. Greater love, here we're talking about not just love, right? Because they, we know that these guys have love, but he wants love that is increasing and abounding, right? Overflowing. So here he says, greater love has no one than this. Who's speaking? Jesus Christ. So he says, oh, whoa. So if, if greater love has no one than this, then that's what? The ultimate. That's the abounding love. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Who are your friends? The believers. And you know who demonstrated that? As I have loved you. Guess who died for us? While we were not his friends, we were sinners. That's even greater, greater than, there's, that's beyond the ultimate. That's Jesus Christ who died for us. He says, love each other like I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Wow. How's our faith? How's our love? Not to God. Real measure to one another. And how bound is it? Or how abounding is it? Is it restricted to the people I dig for the time I dig them? Or is it for everybody? All the time. Everywhere. Now what if? Now do you guys, would you agree with me that not every believer is like an awesome believer? You know, you feel some believers like you're trying to really like you pray for their maturity and then you're like, oh, they did it again. Like, Lord, give me patience. How do I deal with them? How do I become a blessing in their life? Because I feel frustrated right now. Has that ever happened to anybody? You're like, what are you doing in your life? What are these decisions you're taking, you're making? You know, sometimes, you know, little. So those are those ones easy to love or no? Are they easy to love? Let's be honest. Come on. Easy or not? Okay, forget them. How about you? Are you easy to love? <laughs> Am I easy to love? <laughs> so what do you do when someone is just like, just like wrong, but they're a believer? It says for all and, and greater love has no one. Would you die for them? I mean, you're like, die for them? I can barely love them, you know? But he's not praying for love. He's praying for Increasing, abounding love. Greater love has no one than this. That kind, of, that kind of love. What? Can that happen? Is it possible that we love each other with that kind of love? Is, it, is that possible or no? Has it ever happened? Like, in, ever? Like, do you know of anybody that has ever happened to? Not that's existing in the world right now, but biblical, that the Bible through the Holy Spirit has documented to us. I'll give you one example, and I'll give you an example from the Old Testament. Because we feel like, oh, those guys don't really have a lot of love. We have the Holy Spirit, and we have the knowledge. We have the full package, and yet we are so weak sometimes. But let me show you this one. Exodus, chapter 32. Now, to give you context, so you guys remember Moses went up on the mountain, right? And he was on the mountain because that's when God gave him uh, the, the Ten Commandments. You know how long he was on that mountain for? Ten days close, but let's add a little. Forty days, right? Forty days without food. The guy's strong, okay? That's, uh, I would have said, God, can I come back a little bit, you know? But uh, 40 days without food. So after 40 days, and then you guys know what the mountain looked like, right? It, it looked kind of scary. It's like... <laughs> And they're like, if you touch it, even if a, if a cow or an ox or anything touches the mountain, you're dead. 
Okay, well, here Moses didn't touch the mountain. He climbed the mountain. He got up on the mountain. He got up way high, way with God. He's hanging out there. And you see, and things like that. And you don't see, you don't know. There's no, he can't text you. Be like, I'm all right. <laughs> He's up there on that mountain. And day one, I mean, seriously, Ten Commandments, how long does that take? Well, you can read them. It takes you like, you know, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. Day two, day three, day ten, day twenty, day thirty, day four. Like, hey. I think he's dead. That's their conclusion. And I think it's a quite logical. That looks deadly, <laughs> what I see up there. And he hasn't been back 40 days. And if he didn't die from that, he died from hunger and thirst for sure. The guy has to be dead. So make us a God to go before us. I mean, that in itself is silly because guess what? If you see that going on right above you, you know that God is alive and he's real and he's not something that you're going to create right now. But they are loony enough to, to do that, okay? So they make, they tell Aaron, Aaron gets their gold, he makes them a calf, and they worship the calf, and they do some really ridiculous things. Really bad. God is speaking with Moses like, okay, I wish I could have been longer, but go down, those people. And he says, you know what, I'm going to take these people down. I'm going to kill these people. This is God telling Moses. And then Moses is like, no, God, please. You know, and he started to, to plead with God and giving him excuses why God should not kill these people. And you know, guess what? He was successful. Look at verse 14. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. The guy interceded for them like crazy. Are they worth interceding for, honestly? Would you intercede for people like that? That all the time do the wrong things and they always question your authority, which was given by God to you, and you'd be like, oh, Lord, please save their life. You'd be like, why didn't you do it already? <laughs> like, it's been, you know, many years too long. But he interceded, and God heard him, and he says, okay, fine, I take it back. He relented from the harm. He was really going to harm them. Well, so he goes, so then Moses goes down, and he's expecting it to be, you know, if you read the chapter, you're going to be like, he wasn't really expecting to be as bad as God. He's like, you know, God, I think you're a little too angry, you know. Not quite, but, you know, you could, because when he went there, his shock and his response was very different. He's like, <gasps> he took, I mean, who would take those tablets made by God, written by God, would break them? Would anyone do that? I would not. I'd be like, I'm holding this. This is, I'm going to frame, no one can have it, no one can touch it. You do like a museum type thing with alarms and everything that is written by God, made by God. He, ah, poof, broke them. And then he goes down there. He's like, there has to be. And so he, he asks people, hey, whoever is for God, come after me. And then they go and he says, go kill those people that were worshiping the idol. So they go and they kill those people. And then he goes up to God. And then he's like, oh man, that's bad. God's going to do something bad because it's way worse than I thought it was. So look at verse 31. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people. Well, look at verse uh, 30. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin. What you did is not, a, it's not something little. It's a big deal. A great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord perhaps... I can make atonement for your sin. He might listen. Perhaps. I'm not assuring you of anything because this is way worse than I thought it was. So, now he leaves him. He goes up there. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Exclamation mark. I can't believe what these people have done. Yet now, Despite all of this, yet now, here's my, here's my plea with you, God. If you will forgive their sin, dash. But if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. It's an incomplete thought, incomplete prayer, yet it's actually very complete. If you will forgive their sin, that should be followed by, okay, then this, 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 and that. He didn't, he just, if you will forgive their sin, but he knows that what they've done is so bad 
that he's not sure that God would forgive their sin. But then he says, but if not, but if you won't forgive their sin, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm praying for. I pray that blot, I pray blot me out of your book which you have written. What does that mean? Blot me out of your book which you have written. So that means what? Perish. If you will not forgive their sin, then let me go to hell. Literal hell. Greater love has no one than this, than for someone to be willing to die for their friends. These are not good friends, but they are his friends. Or if these are not good believers. These are believers who question him, his authority. They're stubborn. They don't like him. But he says, God, I love them because you have poured out your love in my heart. I frustrating? Yes. Sinners? Oh, man. Unbelievable sinners. They can't get their act right? Yes, Lord, they can't. But I'm willing to die for them. Actually, I'm willing to go to have eternal condemnation for them. Which is an impossibility. Once you're saved, you can't go there. But he says, I'm willing to do the impossible for these guys. Back to our verse. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another. How's your love? How's my love? Is it restricted? Is it weak? Is it shallow? Wherever it is right now, if we can come before God and say, Lord, it doesn't matter even if it's great, if it's strong, even if it's abounding, because even if we've learned from you yourself that we are urged to love the brethren, that we do that, that we increase more and more. I really pray that God would, in 2016, the first day of 2016, because see, the way we can conquer the world can only happen. The way we can captivate the world by the love of Christ is if they can see it in our lives. The only way they can see it in our lives is by seeing our love for one another. Then they see the genuineness of the love of God in us. They can see it in our lives. How's your faith? Do you, are you doubting his existence? Are you doubting his goodness, that he's good, he's a good God? Are you doubting his sovereignty? If so, why don't you pray and say, Lord, I pray that you would perfect what is lacking in my faith. I want to have that. And I know you answered the prayer because you answered both of those things for the Thessalonians. They increased exceedingly in the faith and they also abounded in their love for one another. It's enough, Lord, that I talk about my faith and to talk about my love for you. It's time that my faith shows up. My faith can be seen, that people can see that I love you and that I live for you through my actions. It's time for my love to go past talking about it and loving you to loving the believers that are around me. Next week, we'll talk about the rest of the love in that verse. Um, but if we can just spend a few minutes, if anyone wants to pray out loud.